Hello, everybody, and uh, welcome to our webinar today on uh, how to achieve resilience and scale with uh, global server load balancing and load master from Progress Kemp. Uh, my name is Morris McMullen. I'm a product marketing manager uh, in Progress, and today I'm joined by my colleague Mark Deegan, who's a technical support engineer principal uh, you know, with. Uh, Progress Kemp for quite a while, Mark. Um, uh, so eight years now, yeah. Eight years, okay. So there's probably very little that you uh, uh, don't know about the product. So um, in terms of uh, our agenda today, um, it's uh, very simple. I'm the, the uh, uh, I've got my limited understanding of the underlying technology, so I'll be relying heavily on you, Mark, to uh, just to explain how it all works and how people can use, you know, GSLB to uh, deliver better application availability and scale. Um, we're going to basically have a look at, in terms of the agendas, we're going to have a look at how GSLB works from a technical point of view, have, actually have a look at how DNS works as well. And then look at some of the use cases that fall out of that. So, looking at our first thing here, our first slide, Mark. Uh, this is load balancing just using DNS. So, uh, you yeah. can explain just what's going on here in terms of uh, all the different things happening here. Yeah, so load balancing is kind of a, a generous description of what's going on there. But uh, this would be referred to as DNS round robin, whereby there's two entries, two A entries for an FQDN, uh, example.com in this case. And the first request obviously goes to the first IP and the second request goes to the second IP. And it's quite a simple setup because they literally do one after the other, after the other, after the other. There's no intelligence behind it. And if one server or IP becomes unavailable, the DNS will continue to hand out that IP address as a resolution, even though that there's no server there to connect to. Oh, so how? Okay. Yeah. So this is why we have load balancers. If this here worked perfectly, we'd have no need for load balancers. Exactly. <laughs> All right. So the GSLB then, uh, our uh, global server load balancer, um, what it does is it kind of takes the delegation. Uh, for the FQDN example.com. And what happens is your ISPs or your um, hosts uh, have a delegation for example.com that gets sent to the GSLB. And then the www record that's delegated to the GSLB, we will provide the same IP addresses, but we will do it based on which server is up. So if one server goes down, we'll provide the other IP address. If both of them are up, we'll provide both IP addresses. And this just helps with uh, balancing to making sure that the client always gets to a live server. And also there is a thing called persistence, which isn't available with traditional DNS, where when a client requests uh, FQDN, uh, a resolution for that FQDN, if they come back in that same client, they will get the same result. Whereas the traditional DNS would just step you through however many IP addresses it has for that www delegation. Okay, so there's a, a yeah. So you've got health checks, so you're not sending people to the the an IP address that's down. And actually, I I, I hadn't uh, thought about that idea of the persistence that you're not jumping one person around multiple servers depending on their. So, okay, exactly. uh, right, okay, so that's sort of the basics of GSLB. If we look at uh, it in the context now of uh, Loadmaster and you know, how Loadmaster does it. So very similar here, we've got uh, a Loadmaster running Geo. Geo is, uh, I can do my marketing bit here now, I understand it. <laughs> Geo, Geo is our product name for our Loadmaster global server load balancing. So we refer to it as Loadmaster Geo. So we've got a Loadmaster Geo here and it's 
some way connected to the DNS server there as well. So Yeah, so what happens here is that you've got two paths. You've got the data path and the DNS request path. So what happens is a client will request, first of all, a resource because humans find names easier to remember than IP addresses. So when a human requests www.progress.com, they get sent to a, a DNS server. And that DNS server uh, tries to find the answer so that the computer can go to the IP address to pull the information. So the red line here represents that the DNS is coming from the client going to the DNS server. And usually the DNS server would respond immediately to that, but that's with the traditional round robin uh, method. What we can do with Geo is that if we delegate out that uh, responsibility for that A record to the load master, the load master can do health checks and see which servers are up and only ever give you a response for server or virtual service that's actually online at the time of the request, as opposed to randomly spitting out one of the IP addresses that it has for that FQDN. Um, so the data path then is created from the client through the load master virtual service, and then that connects to the servers on the back end where it's load balance at that point. So you've got two types of load balancing going on here. You've got your DNS load balancing, which happens before the client makes a data request. And then you've got the actual data being load balanced when, they, when the client makes a request to the virtual service. Okay, so as we read this diagram here, that load master geo is actually doing two functions there. It's doing the, uh, the GSLB part, Okay, so it's providing the DNA, but it's also acting as an, a normal load balancer. So exactly. this means we, we don't need a dedicated appliance to for to, each one. For each one. So you can have your normal load balancing and your geo load balancing together. And see, uh, very good. And I just see on your, is it on your next slide that? Again, you can do the, the HA pair, it's a highly available pair of load ma masters there. So that yeah. well is giving you high availability for your regular load balancing. It makes your DNS more resilient as well. Exactly. Uh, so uh, this protects against single point of failure for a device within a data center. So if a single device goes down, nine seconds later, the second device will have come up online with the same IPs will respond to the DNS requests and will pass the traffic to the back end servers, taking over all the connections that the first one had. So that would be high availability, but there's also, uh, I think you have another slide here coming up, uh, what's called geo clustering, which right. takes this kind of high availability and spreads it across multiple sites. Okay. So when you're talking multi-site, you're talking about geos. And when you're talking high availability on site, you're talking about HA. Okay, right. Yeah, we'll, we can drill into that there a bit more when we get, get further on actually on that multi-site bit. Sure. Um, now, one of the other clever things here is that you can decide uh, uh, how to schedule uh, so the, the standard way here is that I understand the round robin bit. It's it's yeah. one for you, one for you, one for you, rinse yeah. and repeat. And uh, you know, and we had a little bit of intelligence there to make things sticky. But uh, I see other things here like weighted round robin. Uh, yeah. So weighted round robin, you kind of think that you have two sites, maybe site A and site B. Site A is your primary site, the first one you had, it's got the most amount of servers, it's got the most amount of resources behind the load balancer, it's able to take more connections, and then site B would be maybe only able to take 30 or 20% of the connections and still stay up. So what you do is you say, well, I want to give out the IP address to site A eight times more than site B. So I'd set it up with 80-20. So I'd have 80% of my traffic going to site A and 20% of my traffic going to site B. And that way then you're not overloading any one particular site and you also have the capability then of failover as well. So if you have multiple sites, 
you can always say, uh, if this one's not available, the second site takes over all the connections. Okay, right. So that is not a case of, if uh, take your 8020 example there, that if uh, site 80 uh, falls over, that site 20 is there going, I can only take 20, 20, a certain amount of connections. You could actually fill the whole lot over to the other site. Exactly. Yeah. So okay. it'd be four to one, you know, so you got four, yeah. the first four results would always be from site A, the next the result yeah. would be from site B, then it will go back to four on site A and then one yeah. okay. site B. Yeah. Okay. Uh, yeah, server load. Um, yeah, so I, how, how, is, how does the DNS, essentially a DNS server see you how busy a server is? Uh, yeah, so this is kind of particular to the Kemp product itself, because what we do is we can do uh, server-based scheduling for uh, for our virtual services on the load master for load balancing. And so we know how much load and how many connections are going to each server in the back end. And with GeoClustering, we can create this new scheduling option called server load, whereby we know how many connections are coming to any one particular IP. And if there's too many connections coming to one, we'll send the next few connections to the other, just to keep it balanced across the, the amount of IPs that we have for an FQDN. So this means you, you're actively looking at how many active connections are connected to the virtual service, reporting that to the DNS, and that then DNS then makes the choice of where to send the next one based on the least amount of connections. Okay, all right. So, but we're, rather than the DNS server is not actually going to each server and say how busy you are, we're looking at the traffic going through the pipe in terms of you know, the load. Okay, that's that's quite a smart way of doing it. Yeah, and that that presumably is quite an efficient way of doing it because the load balancer will have all that information to to hand exactly. in terms of its stats. Okay. Proximity, yes. interesting. It is, and it's yeah. uh, very useful as well. So, uh, as you know, we we live in a global village at this time. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> the world is quite big, though, and sending your traffic around the world to get a response to a web page can sometimes uh, be inefficient. Inefficient. Oh, excuse me. Okay. Inefficient. Yeah. So, what proximity does is it can actually detect from the source IP of the DNS request in which location you're making that request and then send you to the closest load master that's hosting that service uh, to the source IP. So that way, uh, what we do is we look up the IP address, the source IP in the MaxMind database that gives us a list of which ISPs in the world have those IP addresses. And then we can use that to determine your location and then send you to the closest uh, right. service. Okay, so that ties into that location part there as well. The, yeah, um, so yeah. the advantage of location is that you can actually set it to be, rather than a GPS um, location as we think of it, you can actually even set it to country. So you can say, well, if I'm in Ireland, I want to go to the .ie website if I'm in, uh, Europe, I want to go to the .eu website. If I'm in America, I want to go to the .com. Uh, okay, website. right. So you can send based on on actual country to to go to a particular IP, but you can also create custom locations so that internally you can say, well, if I'm coming from 192.168.1 network, I want to go to this virtual service. So if I'm coming from the 10.10.10 .10 network, I want to go to that virtual service. Uh, okay. So, so that even, allows you. Yeah. So even within your own network, you could possibly do some like traffic shaping there that. You know, exactly. Stop that, yeah. people coming across a, a, a WAN and ah, sending yes, data that yes, is yeah. not required. Yeah. yeah. The, the, there's a, 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 a big recollection of us doing a, a, a case study where uh, a, a customer used that uh, location information to um, separate traffic across their 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 Dell EMC storage infrastructure. Uh, yes. It was it, it was medical imaging, 
and that some devices that generated a lot of traffic and rather than having the potential of those randomly hitting the same uh, storage infrastructure, even though it was shared, the same storage nodes, they used this to separate uh, uh, the, the these heavy hitters, as they called them, and directed yeah. them to a certain device, and it kept them away from each other, number one, and also kept them away, away from yeah. the user community. Uh, yeah. Kind of yeah, like uh, bandwidth shaping, you know, but, yeah, ra yeah. rather than consuming your entire uh, one connection for uploading an image that yeah. needs to be accessed from the other side anyway, because yeah. you can send it to your local site, but then you also have the failover so that if the local site is unavailable, the geo will send oh, you right. to the option yes. as well. So, yes. so, oh yes, so you get a double dip in that. Very yeah. good. Yeah, uh, yeah, that's probably a good uh, point here. Actually, we might be running slightly ahead of ourselves on the the, the use cases there. Uh, mm. but, sorry, it just popped into my mind and I thought I'd, I'd, I'd take it out. Uh, first uh, look here is your multi and hybrid cloud. So again, just explain a bit how, how what's going on here in this yeah, highly it's... detailed diagram. <laughs> <laughs> So uh, when you think of hybrid cloud as we're, we're, we're moving with either on-prem and uh, cloud infrastructure or multi-cloud infrastructure or uh, just a single cloud and maybe uh, one offsite backup or something like that. So regardless of what you do, you can have one geo send the data to whichever one is available. So. Let's uh, take it, the instance of this client here. He's making a request to www.example.com. He comes to the GSLB. The GSLB is doing health checks against all these sites. He's able to tell you that the AWS is up and the on-prem is up, but it's got waiting that says, go to the on-prem first, and only if that's not available, send it to the Azure or AWS. So, it will come to the GSLB. The GSLB will say, fine, I'll send you to the on-prem uh, location first. And your first connection comes through, everybody's happy, but then it gets very, very busy on the on-prem and you need uh, an elastic expansion of your capacity. For instance, Black Fridays or whatever. Yeah. Uh, so what you do is you would then call upon your cloud infrastructure to dynamically create more and more servers. And the GSLB is able to see the server load on the prem and say, okay, I'm going to move some of my connections off to AWS or off to Azure and okay. fill out those expanding infrastructures as well. So with only one GSLB, this is possible, but you can also, of course, have a GSLB on each uh, provider and on the prem as well. That was, yeah, my next question here that uh, on, and this marketing does network diagrams uh, <laughs> picture that we have in front of us. Uh, uh, the implementation isn't great there, but uh, I presume that uh, you can have multiple instances of your Loadmaster Geo and run it on a, an instance on AWS, an instance on Azure, an instance on your on-prem. And yes. it'll, yeah, just to give you the resilience for that as well. Okay, very, okay. very, yeah. And yeah, yeah, so, it, it, and you don't need a geo on each of them either. Like you could, if, if you want to have your geo running on your on-prem and it's it's directing traffic to the cloud. So it, it, you, don't, yes. you don't need an actual geo in the cloud. To exactly, it's very, yeah, it's very yeah. flexible. You can, yeah have the DNS point to wherever you need it to be. Um, yeah. And having the capability of deciding when to send the DNS responses for those locations yeah. is very good as well. Yeah. So cool. you can make a determination on the fly, depending on traffic coming through, where you'd like to send your next connection request. Yeah, yeah. and uh, again, excuse me, my ignorance a bit on this here. Presumably, if you have got something in multiple aws zones okay mm -hmm. you, you you could treat them as almost different locations and 
provide to use GSLV to you know balance across your your AWS zones and give resilience across that as well. Exactly, and oh, your yeah. resilience there then becomes not only multi-site but multi-region. So right. you end up okay. being able to support, say, in the Americas and in Europe at the same time, and have multiple regions uh, running in each of them, all coming to one GSLB or multiple yeah. GSLBs, if you wish and being able to distribute your traffic correctly across all of them yeah and that probably brings us into the the, the disaster recovery scenarios here uh that you know it, it, one this is one bit, of, yeah this is one fields, of them yeah yeah this is one of the most popular uh uses for it so yeah. if you have multiple sites and you just need a disaster recovery site so 90 for 99% of your time because you have a 99% uptime on your primary site. Yeah. All your traffic is going to your primary site, but that 1% at a time you need to be able to fail over to your DR site. And that's where the GSLB comes in. You can do what's called fixed waiting, where you send everything to the primary site unless that becomes unavailable. And then you do the failover. Okay. And when the primary site comes back up and starts passing health checks again it automatically fails back so there's no user interaction required for these failovers or to even fail back okay so right i've been doing a little bit of homework on this here and ttl right mm -hmm. time, time to live a, a, a time to live seems to yeah. be an important thing in this disaster recovery scenario just to, yeah uh so give, what, give us a little bit of a, a, an insight on sure so what you want to do is you, you you don't want to fail over your sites unless there's an actual issue and what you do is you inbuild a delay and the easiest way to do that is to inbuild uh, the ttl timing now some people don't want to fail over for five minutes because they can uh, afford five minutes downtime and then that guarantees that a server isn't just restarting before you start to fail over. Um, or and TTL, TTL is time to live, right? So yeah. that's 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 something that you're telling the client, isn't so it? So when, when the DNS request comes in, uh, you can set the TTL for the DNS response and the time that that response is valid for the client. So you can say, well, I want this at a very fast failover time. So I want 15 seconds on my TTL. So every 15 seconds, that client will have to renew uh, the, the DNS request to make sure that it's up to date. So it'll come back every 15 seconds looking for that FQDN. Or you can set it out to be five minutes and sort of say, well, I can afford five minute downtime. Uh, the TTL is now five minutes. There's less requests coming to the GSLB by the clients. And what they do then is guarantee that your primary site has actually failed before you do the failover. Uh, and this prevents false failovers for things like server restarts and for for um, uh, uh, schedule changes or maintenance or things like that, you know? Yeah. So it just, okay. um, it's just an easy way to to extend or reduce the amount of time for a failover. Excellent. Okay. By the way, I see some people uh, popping in questions. We'll answer the, the try and answer the, all the questions uh, at the end of uh, this uh, presentation. So, uh, yeah, if you've got any questions, you can just pop them in in the, the box there under the the uh, the actual slide show. Uh, yeah, we mentioned the, the earlier. Yeah, the, this idea that the location-based uh, uh, redirection. So this is yeah. very simply. Uh, so we more or less covered this here. The, the the concept here of I've got multiple data centers around the globe, and if one of them fails, the the, the people there will can be redirected to the nearest one. Yeah, and the next closest place. location. Yeah, yeah. And, and that's all, as you said, that's all based on essentially their 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 proximity. Actual, the, the, yeah, their latitude and longitude. Yeah. 
Yeah, so you can yeah. enter in the wow. exact latitude and longitude of the right. Loadmaster. If you want to go to that detail, you can. Yeah. And yeah. what that means then is the ISP who's providing the source IP will have a, a, a source location for that. Uh, right. Okay. Server that's handing out those IPs. Right. So when the client comes in, we just reference the database. We see where it's located, and then we can choose to send you to the next closest yeah. server. Okay. So for in, in this case, South America goes offline. Uh, yeah. But that's okay. We'll redirect you to North America instead. Right. Yeah. So this is uh, so there's a, there's a performance part here, sending people to their the the closest place to them and. Also, there's the resilience bit that we can fail over. Mm. Very good. You also have things like um, where this comes in quite handy is uh, the GDPR in Europe. So uh, with Europe, data can't be transmitted outside. And some people have taken to just blocking uh, requests from outside of Europe for their European websites. And so what you can do here with geofencing is say, well, only respond to people within Europe. Uh, anybody outside of Europe, send them to uh, the next one, like APAC or US. Actually, this this has a bit of a security play here as well. That if you have a rogue actor, I will not name any countries, right? Uh, but if you've got a rogue uh, uh, actor country, uh, yeah, you can block them out. I, I, I think this brings us on to our next slide here, right? Uh, yeah, about geofencing, and you, you have to explain this recursive versus iterative. Iterative <laughs> DNS, yeah, yeah. So, um, easiest way to think think about this is where do I get my source IP for the loadmaster? So, when the loadmaster receives a request, it's obviously getting the request from somewhere, and the IP that makes that request is what we see as the source IP. Now, in a recursive DNS lookup situation, the client will ask its local DNS server, do you have a resolution for www.example.com? The local DNS won't respond. It will go to its DNS server and ask its DNS server in the ISP, do you have a resolution for this? And that ISP will go, no, but I know where the authoritative one is, so I'll go out and I'll ask the Loadmaster Geo for that. DNS uh, and the Geo will see the ISPs requesting IP and then send the response to the ISP DNS server. Then that server will pass it back along the chain, eventually landing on the client. But obviously, the client itself is not the source IP in this scenario. All right, because it's only the last DNS server that made the request ah, that you right. see. Yeah. Well, that's not good. So then you have a thing called iterative DNS, which is where the loadmaster shines, really, where the client asks this local DNS. The local DNS just responds with, I don't have, or I'm not authoritative for that. So then the client goes out and asks the ISP. The ISP says, I'm not authoritative for it. Try this one. And then the client goes and asks us, and we see the client source IP, and we send it back. Now. This recursive DNS has been a known issue for some time. And what they've actually developed to, to take this out of account is what's called enhanced DNS lookup or eDNS. And what that does is it does a recursive lookup, but it will carry the source IP of the original request with it when it brings it forward between the different DNS servers. And when it lands on the loadmaster, the loadmaster can support the eDNS and see the actual source IP, know the location, and then send back the correct ah, response. All right. So it, it, it's a problem that has been solved. Yeah. Uh, yeah. Okay. Right. Because I was thinking, oh, well, if that's the case, uh, a lot of the functionality goes uh, away. Right. So <laughs> it's, it's a solved problem. That's okay. Yeah. Yeah. Ah, uh, yeah, I knew I knew somewhere in the deck there there was uh, something. That, yeah, this is a, a load Indeed. master. Yeah, you just block a country. So if you don't like something that's happening, uh, if you see a lot of attacks coming from a certain geography, you you can literally decide not to talk to them. Don't give them a DNS entry to. to exactly. 
So they get back an error empty <coughs> response if they yeah. do a DNS request. Yeah. Right. And that's probably, no, they, they can still connect to you by IP if they knew the IP. But from a, given that most of these attacks are bot based, that would prevent the prevent device from bot. coming through. Right. Okay. Now, the, there is another feature. So the MaxMind database that we use for finding the source IPs, that's also linked to our WAF functionality within the virtual services themselves. And yeah. so you can not only block and stop people requesting DNS entries uh, by country, but you can also block connection from those countries by leveraging that same MaxMind database within. Oh, them. right. Yeah. So even if the if they did come in by IP, if they knew the IP address and avoided looking up a DNS and come in by IP address, we would still be able to identify the source and, and block. block. Them. Yeah. Ah. Right. Okay. Every day is a school day. <laughs> yeah, yeah, learning something here. Right. Okay. And I know this here. Uh, right. You can turn this here around so that you can you can do permits rather than denies, and you can do a certain amount of customization here as well, so that if somebody accidentally is on the raw on a deny list, that you can manually. Uh, put them Add on them a, to a whitelist. Yeah. Uh, yeah. Okay. So there, there is that feature of adding an IP to a whitelist. So if, uh, yeah. if you're on the border with a country and an ISP crosses the border and that okay, ISP yeah. says it's from a country that you're blocking, yeah. you can okay. always add their IPs to a whitelist right. if you do want to leave them in. Right. Okay. Uh, okay. Uh, and just looking here at delivery at scale. Okay. And again, the, the I encountered this uh, in, a, in a again with a case study I was working on with a, a customer who, in the cloud, uh, didn't want to use a single large load balancer for for their traffic, but wanted to instead to move to a, a scenario where they had multiple small load balancers and the cited things like, for example. Uh, they worked out that it, it was uh, cheaper to, to buy smaller machines uh, on uh, the the larger ones, okay, to deliver the same functionality, and that uh, they got more bang for their buck out of it. But also, it gave them more resilience. And yeah, uh, yeah. So that would be in um, uh, represented by us by the real servers being elastic on the back end of the virtual service. So you would have the GSLB pointing to several load balancers on the front end who would then have something like uh, uh, AWS elastic servers on the back end of each of these virtual servers. And as long as the GSLB sees that they're not passing health checks, we're not going to send the data there. But then you'll come to a busy time where more connections are required your servers are multiplied and as your servers are multiplied behind the different load balancers, they all start passing health checks. And now your GSLB is able to pass the connections on to the other servers in the back end. Yeah. Okay. Yeah. Because that was the that was the, the second part of the their reason for doing this model. It allowed them to to scale on demand. They basically had the, the load balancers sitting there turned off weren't costing anything and based on their demand then they just turned them on and once they turned on they were seen as being active and immediately we were able to receive traffic so it was very very simple and very transparent and and allowed them to scale as well because one of the issues they had was you know okay how fast can we make a load balancer instance go you know uh, a single one and how many of them do we need and they didn't know that at the yeah. start, but this just gives them the flexibility, uh, you know, again, with flexible licensing as, as well here, just to be able to spin them up on demand. Yeah, the okay. metered licensing and this is, is yeah. a yeah. good yeah. solution. Yeah. Uh, metered and pool licensing in particular works very well uh, in this type of scenario. Okay, uh, that's sort of also the, the, the uh, uh, end of all the sort of the the use cases, etc. And um, really, you know, 
for those of you who are existing, you know, Loadmaster users and are not using uh, GSLB, very easily you, you can download the free trial and you know set up a test domain and, and point it at your, your Loadmaster, etc. And our support team will be there to help you do that. So you could do it in a, a non-intrusive way uh, uh, there. And you know, any of you are new to Loadmaster, very welcome. Uh, again, download the trial. You can use the trial as a, you know both the, the geo load balancer and a normal load balancer. You get all this functionality in there. You can test it out and see it. And as I say, just go to the uh, kemptechnologies.com website and register there. Um, we do have a couple of questions uh, posed uh, here. Just, just excuse me. Uh, uh, there was a question here. Uh, can you support more than one FQDN? Okay. And that yeah. probably ties into another question here that somebody asked. Can you do uh, disaster recovery for multiple virtual services? So, Sure. So we, we support 1,024 FQDNs on the Loadmaster uh, Geo with 64 virtual services behind each FQDN. So that's 64,000 uh, IPs we can return as a result for from requests. Um, if you're larger than that, you can buy a second LM. Uh, <laughs> yeah. yeah. It's, yeah. it's quite a lot uh, uh, yeah. for 64,000 IPs would be ISP level of, of provision. Um, so you can scale out as much or as little as you like. You can. Okay. Uh, uh, if you have multiple GSLBs, you can configure on one and the configuration will be shared between all the clusters and the health check information can be shared between the clusters as well. So rather than sending health checks across your WAN to the other site to check if the server is up, uh, if you've got 60 uh, virtual services on one side and 100 on the other, you don't want to be sending all that information back and forth. Okay. What we do is we set up a SSH connection between the two sites and then we can uh, share the health check information from low, from the first cluster to the second cluster and report on that all the time in real time. Okay, right. Another question here. Uh, AWS has ELB, Elastic Load Balancer. How can this solution be integrated with ELB? Um, would you even use ELB in this scenario? So usually you'd use uh, the Elastic servers in the background. So they, you'd create on the Loadmaster a virtual service. You'd assign your uh, Elastic servers to the back end. Every time a server comes up, it gets added to that virtual service. And then the geo would respond with whichever virtual service is up or down. Okay. So you can yeah. have one GSLB across multiple uh, load balancers reporting for all those virtual services. Right. I think the last slide there, second to last slide, we discussed that. Right. Okay. So uh, really, you wouldn't need to have uh, ELB in there, Elastic Load Balancer, to achieve this. You, you wouldn't need to integrate them. No, the no. DNS request is different to the service request. Yeah, so yeah. Okay. Yeah. GSLB would yeah. be the DNS part. Yeah. Okay. Here, uh, here's a very technical question. Uh, for proprietary hybrid cloud systems that require forms based authentication, your current system require these providers to utilize basic authentication services and the ordered pass credentials. Is there any plan to update this requirement to so that we can properly integrate all hosting providers? So uh, I don't know if that makes sense to you. Sorry, Mark, for giving you a, a load of fair beach. Uh, <laughs> it seems to be related to ESP rather than DNS. But yeah, uh, yeah. just to give you an idea, so we do per, um, we do support not only forms and basic, but also KCD, uh, SAML, uh, MFA, 
all different yeah. types of things, okay. client certs. Yeah. Uh, so with ESP, it can be it can be different forms of authentication on the front end and to the, to the back end. Okay. So uh, whoever had that question, maybe if you had to reach out to actually reach out to Mark and he'll be on the support desk. Uh, yes. Uh, be able to help you uh, get to the bottom of that. Uh, there's sort of a couple of questions here that I'm just going to sort of lump together. One is, you know, how is it licensed? Can I buy a standalone geo? And the other one is, is it all hardware or can be uh, virtual? So the uh, the first thing is that uh, this uh, geo functionality is available on our hardware platforms, on our virtual on-premise platforms and our, and our cloud platforms. So it's available everywhere, okay? Uh, the question there, can you buy a standalone geo? There is a standalone geo. Uh, you, if you really wanted to buy it, we have it there, okay? Um, uh, yeah, so we, do, we don't really so, it's something we don't uh, let's say promote or market because people normally use it use in the, conjunction with the intelligence conjunction. of the load balancer as well. But yeah, yeah. Uh, but yes, you can. And in general, how is it licensed? Uh, the the GSLB functionality is included with anybody on if you're on enterprise plus support. Correct. You have yeah. GSLB functionality enabled. Okay, and I think that's all our questions at this stage. Um, I, Mark, I'd like to thank you for your your, your patience. No problem, and, Morris. Uh, yeah, anytime. Uh, and your tolerance of uh, uh, marketing those network diagrams. Uh, <laughs> we'll, we'll try better the next time. Uh, and I'd like to thank you all for attending today. I know your time is valuable. And uh, you all have uh, a good day. Uh, wherever you are. Thank you all very much. Thank you, everybody. Right. Bye. Bye-bye.